Okay. Now streaming. It says, uh, yep, it says we're live. All so, right. Away. Okay, thanks, Scott. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, everybody. Welcome again uh, to the National Committee meeting and our uh, agenda this, this for the first session, which goes until from now until quarter to two Eastern Standard Time is a one point agenda. And that is the opening report and discussion. Um, and uh, Joe is going to us to take it away. So, Joe. Thank you very much, uh, Anita, and good afternoon, uh, comrades. Rosanna and I uh, are so happy to see uh, all of you today. Um, we hope uh, everybody is staying healthy and uh, uh, strong, uh, physically distant, but, but socially close. That, that is so important. I keep saying it, but I want to say it again because these demonstrations are taking place all over the country and, um, and we're participating in them. And, and that's a good thing. I had a chance to get out the other day. Um, on Thursday, we were down in Union Square and it was a beautiful and inspiring thing to see. But it was also a little uh, worrisome because uh, the crowd was not physically distancing. And, um, and you know, when you get into a, a march kind of situation and people are shouting and uh, sloganeering and, and, and all of that kind of thing, it becomes even more uh, uh, dangerous because, you know, uh, droplets are spreading in the air and some people aren't wearing masks. And, and, uh, and so it, it, if you're in a situation like that, we want to ask you to take a step back, take a step out. Um, the young comrades were saying, go to the back of the demonstration or the march with, 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 with the banner, stay, stay uh, at least six feet uh, apart. Again, it is so important. We need each and every one of us. You can't overemphasize that, particularly now because we're at a turning point um, um and in fact i think that we have turned uh but i'll come back to that in uh just a moment uh but before we get started uh i i wanted to ask the nc to uh, pause for a moment and remember comrade uh, frank stearns uh raglan george uh, Richie Hoyan and Harry McAllister, all of whom fell victim uh, to the coronavirus. They were all wonderful comrades. They, they never gave up, gave out, or gave in. They kept the faith. And their legacies live on not only in our hearts, but in today's battles. Let us have a moment of silence in their honor. Comrades, um, as you know, our country is in the midst of an unprecedented uprising initiated by uh, the African-American people and joined by our Asian and Latino, Native American and white sisters and brothers. Millions are saying hell no to institutionalized racism. And this is happening not only here uh, in America, but but all over the world, you know, we've gotten so many messages on, on Facebook and on Twitter and by email. We've seen it on the news on every continent. Humanity is standing up, demonstrating their solidarity uh, with us. They are declaring that George Floyd and before him, Breonna Taylor, and before her, Amhad uh, Arbery have, uh, and before them, so many others, uh, our brothers and sisters have not died in vain. You know, I said a moment ago, we, we are at a turning point, I think. Uh, some five days ago, Trump walked in front of St. John's Episcopal Church in DC and, and, and held a Bible upside down. It was an attempt to uh, turn democracy and the uprising upside down. 
but instead it helped turn the struggle right side up. The images of federal cops and troops on horseback, some of them uh, armed with batons and shields, beating and maiming a peaceful, lawful assembly in Lafayette Square to make way for Trump's Bible thumping moment won't go away. Like the scenes of Brother Floyd gasping for breath while he called for his mother uh, and Brother Aubrey being shotgun to death, like the story of Sister Taylor being gunned down by no-knock police, these will be among the defining moments and, and images of our time. This is a moment of great promise, but also one of great danger. The mass democratic uprising for justice is calling into question this country's very foundation. People are asking, why is this happening over and over? and new majorities are realizing the answer. The nation is waking up to the fact that it's not just a few bad apples, but the whole barrel that's rotten. And it's not just the police, it's the courts, it's the laws, it's the people who wrote them, and it's the system underlying it. It's the same thing with COVID, right? Native American, Latino, African Americans are dying at three times the rate of everybody else. And some, like Pat and Paul, um, are calling it genocidal. Um, that's William Patterson and Paul Robeson. And they're right. The system is rotten to the core and it's got to be changed. But standing in the way, is the extreme rights grip on the presidency, the Senate, the courts, and standing behind them are the banks, um, the Chamber of Commerce, the police, and together they've been ripping the whole country off. Truth is, you know, the country has been uh, in a crisis since the Great Recession. Remember, it was the banks that targeted Black folk, Latinos, seniors, and uh, we never recovered. None of us, Black, Brown, White, Asian, wages stayed flat, debt, particularly student debt skyrocketed. Students graduated from college, they had to move back with mom and dad because they couldn't afford to move out. Marriages were delayed. Um, Folks had to work two, three jobs, right? Just to survive. And it was this, if we remember, that first gave rise to the Obama movement, then to Occupy, and later to um, the Sanders campaign. The broad uh, democratic movement against the extreme right didn't grow out of nowhere. And neither did what we've come to uh, call the socialist moment. Both grew out of the class and democratic struggle. Today, these two struggles, class struggle and the battle for democracy are intersecting in powerful, and I think you gotta say even explosive ways. It was the women's movement that greeted the Trump inauguration with literally millions of protesters all across the country. And it was the immigrant rights protests at airports in opposition to the Muslim ban that dealt the first legal and political blow in Trump's first 100 days. And then it was the workers, strike wave, right? Beginning with the teachers and then the, the auto workers, uh, and it's continuing, uh, Amazon fighting for decent wages and working uh, conditions. And now the fight against racism, against police violence has given rise to an all people's uprising that has shaken the foundations of the Republic. Fighting anti-black racism, indeed fighting uh, racism against all people of color and the unique role of the African-American people in the struggle to advance democracy is once again making itself powerly, powerfully felt. Policing 
and everything surrounding it have become central issues in the election campaign. It's literally uh, Trump's law and order versus our right to breathe. Battle lines that, 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 that have the potential uh, to reshape not only policing and the criminal justice system, but the country's approach to racial justice in general. The people's demands will not go away. Measures like uh, maintaining a national database on police killings seem modest. More importantly, community control, uh, along with defunding the police departments have come front and center. In addition, the time is way past due to get rid of racial profiling, uh, three strikes you out, uh, trying teenagers as adults, uh, the remains of broken window, uh, 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 stop and frisk policing, uh, and, and let's not forget uh, sentencing disparities for drug use. The time has, has, has come to consider radical reform of the prison system. Here, uh, uh, prison abolition uh, is a growing demand. Uh, some say, well, it's not realistic, but it's, it's, it's gripping the imagination of, 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 of millions of, of, of people. More short, short term, COVID-19 is spreading like wildfire in the penitentiaries, making early release and alternatives to incarceration a growing demand. You know, if Trump can, uh, if Trump's cronies uh, like Paul Manafort and 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 uh, Mr. Cohen and others can 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 be let go, get early release, then they gotta let my people go too. You know what I'm saying? But this is just the the tip of the iceberg. The the whole system of institutionalized racism has been put on the table from voter suppression to uh, unequal COVID deaths, uh, education, healthcare, housing, wage differentials, uh, all of these racist uh, practices are crying out uh, to be dismantled. And, and, and you gotta ask the question, what will it take to accomplish this with unemployment at 25%. Uh, they say it dropped yesterday uh, just a little bit. We ain't paying too much attention uh, to that because it's double that in black communities and brown communities anyway. What will it take to accomplish this with unemployment at 25% generally and double that in black communities, right? What will it take to uh, accomplish this when people can't pay their mortgages and rent? What will it take now that employer health care is gone and folks can't afford to go to the doctor? You know, you got to ask, what are people supposed to do? This is an emergency and it requires emergency measures. To me, this is where uh, the struggle for uh, democracy meets the socialist moment. Capitalism can't solve the crisis. It couldn't solve it before COVID and it damn sure can't solve it now. The only possible means for addressing it is massive government intervention. Starting with the extension of unemployment compensation after July the 31st, but that's just the beginning. In light of what's happening on the streets, the uh, bills like the uh, Kamala Harris, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, a $2,000 a month uh, proposal is looking better and, and better. Uh, you want to avoid a social explosion in this country? Uh, uh, they better think about that. But for that to happen, it's got to be organized uh, and connected to the election campaign uh, and Trump and the GOP have to be defeated in November. It's hard to imagine, uh, it's hard to overstate rather the importance of doing this. The fascist danger 
has grown even more severe in, in recent days. If anybody had any doubts, and there are some who still do, I know, and that's okay. Uh, but if you have any doubts, Trump's action this week should make you want to take another look. It wasn't just the use of force at Lafayette Square or the ordering of low-flying uh, military uh, uh, black or Black Hawk helicopters over demonstrators. Um, it wasn't only the, the threat to deploy the military onto the nation's streets. It was also the, the language of dominating the battle space and, and the threats of jail time. And, and add to that uh, was the threat to designate Antifa as terrorists and, and, and blaming uh, the extreme left. Senator uh, Ron Wyden of, of Oregon was right when he said, and we quote, the fascist speech that Donald Trump just delivered verged on a declaration of war against American citizens. And let's not forget, this was preceded by Trump's encouragement of our militias to liberate states with state in, uh, uh, shelter in place regulations. The state legislature in Michigan had to cancel a session um, because they were being threatened by armed uh, goons. Can you imagine? And I got to say, the silence in response, at least up until a couple of days ago, was deafening. There's good news, though. After the Battle of Lafayette Square, that's changed. There's been a revolt. Uh, among the generals, some retired, some on active duty. Now even they are saying that Trump is a threat to constitutional order. And behind that, you best believe there are important forces in the ruling class. It's pretty clear now that the momentum in the country is moving against Trump. It's been building, you know, uh, in reaction to the mishandling of the coronavirus, uh, the attacks on uh, the World Health Organization, the threatening to put people back to work uh, uh, after Easter, and now with uh, uh, the, the, his threats to uh, shoot the looters. But the battle is far from over. In fact, Trump in coming days and weeks will, is likely to grow even more dangerous because his back is against the wall. Our party has said from the beginning that Trump represents a fascist danger. And we will work without apology to defeat him and everything he represents. Our focus in this fight is unity on the issues. Our aim is to shift the balance of forces in a direction more favorable to our working class and people. This will not be an endorsement of other candidates or parties. This will not be an expression of lesser evil politics. It will be an endorsement of doing the nuts and bolts organizing on the ground. It will be an endorsement of struggle. And that's what has to happen between now um, and election day and uh, and after the election. Speaking of struggle, I want to say a few words about the party. You know, folks, um, comrades, it's been a, a challenging period for us. Um, you know, with COVID and everything, everybody been sheltering in place and, and all of that. But I'm, I'm happy to say that we are meeting the challenge. Since the last NC, uh, uh, growth is up, uh, uh, PW circulation is up considerably, and, and congratulations to uh, all the comrades there, uh, Chauncey and CJ and Wojcik and Mark and uh, Barbara and, and uh, Urschel and, and all of them. 
Uh, the growth of the circulation of CPUSA.org is up, and congratulations to, to Laura and to uh, Scott and to the editorial collective. Um, we have taken uh, some new initiatives, right? First, the town hall and, and then the May Day event. And now with our exploring on how to move forward on the unemployment issue. We have 789 new members since February. Um, uh, 63 joined during the month of February, but most came in after Bernie left the Democratic primary. Some 287 have joined since May 20th when I last reported, uh, when Rosanna and I last reported to our national board. Uh, it was 502 just a couple of weeks ago. We have 11 new clubs. Uh, we have a group of about 30 young communists meeting in uh, uh, New York. Um, they are uh, organizing book clubs, they are going through the demonstrations, they are doing uh, a mutual aid. It is a beautiful sight to see. They are Black and Latino and White and South Asian and Chinese and Japanese, uh, and, and, and they're doing a, uh, a, a, hell of a, a hell of a job. Uh, we have... Um, um, uh, new forms of uh, interacting with our new members uh, uh, with this forum and uh, Discord, and uh, many of them are here today and welcome. We're very happy to have you. And my guess is that with Discord and our, our new member orientations and the Ed Department School and webinars, that these are the main ways that we're interacting with people who are joining. And here too, the numbers have doubled and tripled. For example, 411 people registered for our weekend schools with about 357 participating. In our last webinar, we had 300 plus registered. You know, we used to have to fight four months ago to get to 200. Now it's coming uh, easy. Um, it is all very new and very fragile, of course, and we have to nurture it, work with it, not take our eye off of it but it's very, very encouraging. And most encouraging, and I kind of hate to say it, um, the party is united. Um, I hate to say it cause you know, you say it's united and you look over here and then something happens and you go, damn, how did I miss that? We saw um, uh, uh, that unity expressing itself at our last NC and and that's a source of uh, tremendous strength. It is a strength born out of our ideas. It's a strength born out of our uh, uh, practice uh, and our experience. But it is also a strength that represents the objective situation in the country and its impact on us. Marxism, uh, the communist outlook, uh, is a living doctrine. And the world around us has an impact on how it expresses itself. You know, I said earlier that the movements are, are having a huge and explosive impact on the struggle for democracy. And that because of that, the country's understanding of racism has, uh, uh, has changed for the for better. And that's been true in the party for a minute now. And while it's not second nature, um, fighting racism is a recognized part of our toolkit. We, we talk about it, we challenge it uh, when it manifests itself. And, and, and we do so maybe with, uh, not, maybe not with ease, but, but, but not with discomfort either. The fight against sexism and for women's equality is beginning to have that impact as well. I say beginning. New ways of thinking and acting are occurring, but we also got to say we're not there yet. Our culture is changing, but it hasn't changed. Uh, and for it to change, 
the, the bearers of male supremacy, uh, we men have to make that happen, right? Nobody else can do it. And that means developing a capacity for re-examining ourselves, uh, a, 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 a capacity for greater uh, self-criticism. It means listening. It means respecting women's spaces and bodies. And that includes a not only physical space, but also emotional, uh, intellectual, and verbal space. And it means uh, continuing to fight to accept women's leadership. The shift in mass thought patterns that we're seeing today on racism shows that that's possible. You know, in a certain sense, we are in the midst of two uprisings, one on gender that started from three and a half years ago, the other uh, on racism. And if we uh, build uh, on the unity of both, that working class uprising that is coming, that we saw hints of in the strike wave, that is uh, just on the horizon, y'all, it's going to be unstoppable. And we've got to work and fight uh, to ensure that it happens. Uh, thank you very much for listening.